Have you ever wondered about the things that God knows about your life? The things that you do, the things that you say, can He see them? Can He hear them? Does He know the thoughts of your mind? Does He know the secret things that you do that no one else knows about? How much does God really know about you? And if He knows you, does He still love you? Does He care about you or is He too busy taking care of the rest of the universe and everybody else? The psalm that we're studying today will give us the answers to these questions. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised to find out that God knows everything about you and yet He still loves you very, very much. God bless you. It's good to be back with you again today. If you're in one of our congregations in Israel, in Tel Aviv or Haifa or some other location, we'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming out today. If you're in the internet right now and you're watching this service, then God bless you and we hope you tune in again. You're one of many people that do watch the services over the internet. So I'd like to talk to you today about Psalm 139. Psalm 139 in your Bibles, if you'll turn there, please. And we're going to continue in our series called the Seven Psalms series. You may remember that it's a primer or an introduction into the book of Psalms. And today we're on Psalm 139. So I'll begin reading to you from verse 1, and then we'll stop and we'll discuss these verses and what they mean for your life today. So in Psalm, 30, Psalm 139, verse 1, let's begin reading. And it says, O Lord, you have known me and searched me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought from afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all of my ways. There is not a word on my tongue. But behold, Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me about behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot comprehend it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall guide me, if your, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say the darkness will fall on me, even the night around me shall be light. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days that were fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. And when I am awake, I am still with you. I'd like to talk to you today about this psalm. I think it's one of the most beautiful psalms in the book of Psalms, probably one of the most beautiful chapters in all of the Bible. I would like to talk to you today about heaven's designer. Heaven's designer. There's a designer in heaven who very purposefully made creation. And he also made you and I. 
So as we talk about the design that God has done in the universe, I would like to focus today on you. I would like to focus on the work that heaven's designer did to create you and to make you his child. It says in the first few verses that it says, God, you have searched me and known me. You know everything about me. You know when I get up. You know where I walk to. You know when I lay down. You know the words that I speak and the thoughts that I think. In other words, God knows everything about you. He knows everything. Have you ever wondered about what God does know about you? Have you ever wondered about if God even does know you? And if he does, does he care for you? Does he love you? Because if he knows everything about you, I think you'll agree that sometimes we're not very lovable, are we? But God still cares for you, even though he knows everything about you. This first part of this Psalm 139 says that he does know everything about us. He knows everything we do. He knows everything we say. He knows everything we're planning. Now, if you think about that, that means that also he knows the secrets in our lives because it did say he knows the thoughts that we think. If he knows the secrets in our lives, then you know that we've all got some things to be ashamed for, right? He knows the sins in our life too. The good news is, is that even though he knows them, he still loves you and he loves me. He still cares about us and he still desires us to be with him and to be his children in heaven forever at the end of this life on earth and even to be his children now in this life on earth. It says he knows everything about us. Look at what it says here. It says, you have hedged me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too high for me. It's too wonderful. I cannot comprehend it. Now think about that. God knows everything about you. He knows all of your shortcomings. He knows all of your sins. And yet, He still wants to care for you. It says He's hedged you from in front of you and before you, and before you or behind you. So what that means is He's put a protection in place in front of you. He's also put His protection in place behind you. You may remember in the book of Exodus, Hasefer Shemot, Be'evrit in Hebrew, but in the book of Exodus, when God led the children of Israel out of the land of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, that he was their protector in front and behind them. And Pharaoh, Paro, as we would say in Hebrew, could not get to the children of Israel because God was protecting them. He was leading them in the front. He was protecting them from behind. That's the way God's love is for you. That's the way his care is for me and for us, you see, because he cares for us. Now, the amazing thing to me is he knows all our sins. He knows all our problems. He knows our wicked, evil thoughts, and he knows everything about us and yet he's still willing to lead us and protect us and guide us. Now that's pretty impressive, I would say. That's pretty awe-inspiring because you would think that if God was like any other person, that he would see our problems, he would see our sins, he would see how wicked and evil we were at times, and he would say, I'm not going to have anything at all to do with you. But instead, he knows all of our secrets, all of our sins, better than you do yourself. And yet he still desires to have you and to keep you and protect you. That's an amazing thing when I think about that. It just goes to show you that you could never earn your way into approval with God, right? You could never earn your way into salvation or righteousness, so... Why even try anymore? Because if you just rest in the Lord, He will do the work in your life and He will make your heart into a heart after His heart. 
He will make you into a man or a woman that has a heart after his heart. And righteous things will just happen in your life after that. Cease your struggling and strife. Let go and let God make you the person he wants to make you. It's only then that you'll be successful in that anyway. If you try to do it on your own, then that's pride. And God is looking at you and you're basically saying to God, I don't want your help. I don't want your mercy. I can do this on my own. I'm righteous. I'm good enough to make it into heaven. But God's saying, no, you don't understand. My standard for entering heaven is perfection. God is perfect and he's holy and he must judge sin. And the Bible has said in the Torah, and also in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, that the wages of sin is death. When we sin, God has committed himself to punishing sin, and he said that the punishment for sin is death. But when we believe in the righteousness that he gives through the cross of Yeshua HaMashiach, the cross of Calvary, then we are accepting his atonement, his kippur, his atonement for us, and we are receiving that to take care of and pay for our sins. So why not let God put his hedge in front of you and behind you? Why not cease all of your planning and striving to try to be righteous and to do all of the works of the law on your own? When you do that, it's really an insult to God because he knows all of your sins. He knows your wickedness. He knows your evil thoughts all the time. And when you try to pretend that you're righteous enough for heaven, perfect, God knows that that's just not the truth. And so God says, I know everything about you, and yet I still love you, and I want to care for you if you will just let me be the one who protects you, who makes you righteous. Let me be the one who leads you. Let me be the one who fights your battles for you. Let me be the one that you lean on and the one that cares for you in a way that only he can do. That's what he's asking us to do. If you go on down to the next section of this verse, of these verses, you find in verse 7 that it says that, where can I go to flee from your spirit? And it says, where can I go in a place where you are not there, Lord? And David, the king who wrote this psalm, is saying, God, you're everywhere. I can't run away from you. Jonah the prophet found that out. Yonah Hanavi, Nachon, Ba'ir Yafo, in the city of Jaffa. He went and tried to run from the presence of God. But God was there too. And he was there when the great fish had swallowed Jonah and Jonah cried out to the Lord and the Lord was there and he heard him. So he was there at Jaffa, Jaffa when he fled from the voice of the Lord. The Lord wanted him to go to Nineveh. And God was there. He saw him flee. And then Jonah went out to the sea and Jonah got cast overboard and was swallowed by the great fish, but even under the water. You see, God was there. God will be with you no matter what you're going through. No matter where you are, no matter what kind of problems you have in life, God will be with you. You just can't get away from his presence if you belong to him. So obviously, that's the question, isn't it? Do you belong to him? And how can you belong to him? Well, you belong to him, again, by believing in the work of righteousness that he did on your behalf on the cross of Calvary when he became that kippur or that atonement to take care of your sins. Now, with your sins taken care of, you don't have to worry about being cast out of heaven. You don't have to worry about going to hell because your sins have been cleaned in the way that only God can do. That's why the Mashiach had to be the Lord himself. You see, because no man was righteous enough. No man was without sin. No man was pure enough to take our sins upon himself and be a blemish-free sacrifice for our sins. 
That's why the Lord himself had to become a man and he had to put our sins upon himself so that the guiltless could replace the guilty. So that the one who had no sins could become the atonement for the ones that did have the sins. That's you and I. And so as we see these verses today, it's saying that God will take care of you. He knows everything about you and he will be there with you at all times. In fact, Yeshua, Jesus said, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You can count on him. He will be with you always. Only God can make that promise. Only God can promise to be with everybody, everywhere, all of the time. Because only God is everywhere at once and is in all places in time at the same time. No other man could be the Mashiach or the Messiah. No other man could make that promise. That's the promise of the Lord to be with you no matter where you go, no matter what you're going through, no matter the troubles that you may face today, no matter what is going on in your life, a sickness, a problem with money, a problem with friends, a problem with enemies, no matter where you are, God will be there with you if you belong to Him. And so that's what those verses are about. As we go on down to the next verses then, we see another part of this psalm. And it says in verse 13, it says, Lord, you have formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, I would like to talk to you today, as I said earlier, about heaven's designer. I'd like to talk to you about heaven's engineer. Now, I know a little something about engineering. I was a solid state physicist and what they call a senior staff engineer for a little company called IBM. I've done engineering consulting all my life. Some of the products that I designed many years ago working for companies are still being sold in high-tech stores around the world today. I was in a store the other day and I saw one of the products that I designed many years ago and now it's being sold all over the world. I was a part of a team with other engineers but I'd like to tell you something about engineers and engineering. First of all, I want you to understand that an engineer's work is 90% planning and it's only 10% execution of the plan. In an engineer's work, you will spend all of your time working on computers and working on paper trying to plan what it is that you're going to do. And as you're planning this thing, you must simulate it through computer simulations. So before your product is ever, ever built, you know what it's going to be like. You know what it's going to run like, and you know what it's going to do. You know things that are going to be problems with your product before any of it is ever built because you've run it on these computer simulators. And you've spent 90% of your time in that project trying to make sure that all of the problems have been worked out, that your product will not have any bugs in the hardware or the software, the electronics. In none of that will you have any problems that could make that a bad product. And so we would spend all of our time in front of a computer screen using a language called VHDL, which is a very high-level description language for hardware design. Software engineers would use similar things in that they would use what we call simulators or emulators or debuggers to get the bugs out of something before the code, before the software is finished. And if you think about that, both the software and the hardware have to be completely designed. They have to be completely tested you have to think through everything about them before you ever build even the smallest part of that product. You don't just build the product and see what's wrong. You design it for 90% of your project time and then when you have confidence that it's all ready, that's when you put it together. 
That's what we did. So it shouldn't surprise you that God would see everything about you. He would see everything about you before you even existed. Certainly, if we know how to do that, God knows how to do that, and He's much better at it than we could ever, ever be. And by the way, He won't be releasing any 1.1 or 2.0 updates to the software because He got it right the first time, you see. And so, God is the perfect engineer. He is heaven's designer. He's the one that put all the universe in place. He's the one that hung the stars in the firmament. He's the one that put the planets there, that put our sun at the right distance so we would not be too close and burn up or we would not be too far away and freeze. He made our weather just right to where it would be conducive or okay for life to be on this planet. He did all of these things, but he also says in this psalm, he created you. We know in the book of Bereshit, by Sefer Bereshit in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, that God made man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. He created them in his image to be eternal spirit. God's not flesh and bones and blood like you and I are. God is spirit. He's eternal spirit, and he created us to be children to him in his image. He gave us an everlasting spirit. The tragedy is, is we go around thinking that this physical body is all there is. And we say, well, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know anything about an everlasting life after this life. I don't know anything about it, so this must be all that there is. You know, if you think about that, that's kind of like a little seed of an apple tree, let's say. A little seed. That's like that little seed saying, well, I don't know. People tell me that one day I'm going to be a tree, but I've never seen that before. I'm just this tiny little seed, so this must be all there is. But you see, it's in nature all around us, isn't it? It's in nature in the plants, the trees, the grass. Everything around us turns from a little seed into something that looks very different from what it looked like when it was a seed. Well, that's what these verses here are saying is God knew everything about you before you actually turned into what it is that you are today, a human being. And God also knows what you're going to be like when you finish this life on earth and you are there in His presence if you know Him. But you cannot be in His presence, like I said earlier, if you have sin in your life and you have no forgiveness for that sin. You don't have a kippur. You don't have an atonement to cover your sins. Well, see, that's the bad news because the Bible says that everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Therefore, nobody can be in the presence of God because of the sin in their lives. God knew that. He became a man to come into this world and live the life that no one else had ever lived, a life that was completely without sin keeping the law at all times so that he would qualify at being the blemish-free Lamb of God who would be sacrificed for our sins and take away the sins of the world. That's what Hasefer Yeshayah ve'chamishim v'shalosh omer. That's what the book of Isaiah in chapter 53 says, is that the Mashiach would take our sins upon himself. He would die for our sins. He would be cut off out of the land of the living. And so, as we see these verses, we now think of God as heaven's designer. He's the one that knew all of your parts, everything about you, before any of it existed. Now, I'd like to talk to you about an aspect of this. Maybe you've never thought about this. As an engineer, I can tell you that most electronic engineering of what we call hardware, the high-tech stuff, that the software fits onto, I can tell you that almost all of it today is made out of a substance called silicon. Now, as an engineer, and physicists would know this, chemists would know this, silicon is basically just made from sand. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a lot of sand on this planet. It's very plentiful. But if you think about that, they take the sand 
They make it into a silicon piece called a wafer. And then they use these laser lights and these real small lensing and they photographically etch an image very, very small onto this silicon to where it can be so small that you could put 45 to 100 million transistors on something the size of your little fingernail. 45 to 100 million transistors in this hardware design. And that's put on a wafer, that's what we call it, a wafer of silicon. And silicon is made from sand. Well, what are you saying, Stephen? Where are you going with this? Simply this. If sand on the seashore can turn into a supercomputer or one of your computers that you have and that you work with or maybe your personal computer, if it can turn into the electronics for a camcorder or a camera or for a cell phone or for military equipment and for all of these other electronic things that are designed using silicon-based technology, then why can't God turn dirt into a man. You see? If we know how to take sand and turn it into a computer and all of this high-tech stuff, don't you think God is smart enough to know how to take dirt and turn it into a man? He does know how, and you and I were created, formed from the dirt by His hand. We were created in His image to be children unto Him. Therefore, we have eternal spirit. But a spirit doesn't have a body like you and I have. And it goes back to that seed thing. A seed doesn't look like the plant that it's going to become either. So it shouldn't surprise you that you and I, who are now in a fleshly body, will one day be given the opportunity to be in a spiritual body. And that body will be far greater than this little body that we have today. And that body will not be affected by sickness, that body will not be affected by time, but will be as the angels in the kingdom of God, serving before the Lord's throne and worshiping Him forever and ever in the joy of His presence, and where He says there's everlasting joy in His presence and things that you cannot even imagine here. We're in these little seeds, but one day we're going to be much much greater than this and our bodies are going to be much much different than this because of God who designed us that way he's heaven's designer he hung everything in the universe together he put you together both the physical part and the spiritual part and it says here that he knows everything about you he knows all of your days before any of them existed it says, your eyes saw my substance before they were even formed. And in your book, they were all written, the days that were fashioned for me, when really none of them existed at that time. Now that doesn't mean that God made your days and you cannot live them any way you want. He does give you the power of choice. Now, some people who believe in what's called Calvinism would say, no, God doesn't give you the choice because God has to be sovereign. He has to be the one that does everything and man can do nothing. So God can do anything, man can do nothing. And I find it amusing sometimes that the Calvinist, in trying to protect the sovereignty of God, are basically telling God, God, you can do anything you want except you cannot create a man that truly has the power of choice in his life. You're forbidden to do that, God. They're the ones taking away the sovereignty of God by taking that stand. But this verse simply says that God, because he knew the future, he knew what you would do every day of your life. He knew where you would go. He knew the decisions you would make. You may be walking along now and, and you say, I think I'll turn left. And then you remember this verse and you go, oh, God thinks I'm going to turn left, so I'll turn right instead. But God knew from the beginning of time that there would be a day when you're walking along and you're going to try to pl play a trick on God and you're going to say, I'm going to turn left, but then you're finally going to decide to turn right. God knows that. You can't fool God. You see, He knows everything that you're ever going to do and he's known it from the beginning of time. So as we look at these verses, we find out that we really don't have any secrets from the Lord. 
We don't have any secrets from God. It's impossible to have any secrets from Him. It's best just to acknowledge your sin, just to acknowledge your secrets, and say, Lord, I'm not righteous enough. I do have sin, and I know because of what the Torah says, because of what the Tanakh says about sin, I know that I'm not permitted to stand in your presence in heaven forever. But Lord, I don't want to go to that other place. Lord, I want you to please bring me into heaven. So Lord, I'm not asking for you to give me what I deserve because that would be hell. But Lord, I'm asking, give me your mercy so that I can be with you in heaven. That's the best way to go about it, you see. And as we continue in reading this, he then goes on in verse 17, and he says, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. And when I'm awake, I'm still with you. Well, up to this point, we've covered basically three other things in this psalm. Psalm 139 at the first part says that God knows everything that we do. He knows every word that we say. He knows every thought that we think. The part right after that said, He's with us wherever we might go. We can be in the night. We can be in the day. We can be in the sea. We can be at the top of the mountain. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're going through in life. He's promised He will never leave you nor forsake you. If you are His, He's going to take care of you. He's going to hedge you before and behind. And He's going to be with you at every single place in your life. And He knows everything about you. And He still desires to be with you. The third part of the psalm that we just covered was that He is heaven's designer. He designed every cell in your body to multiply by division the way it does. He knows how your body heals itself because He designed it that way. He knows how your mind thinks. He made it. He created it. He put together all the hardware and the software. So don't you think He knows how to read your thoughts? He can see inside just like we could in that simulator as we're designing that product, what was going to be happening in all these different things and what is happening when that hardware does exist as we troubleshoot the problems in it. And He knows in the same way What's going on inside your life? What's going on inside your brain, in your mind, in your heart? He knows all of these things. He's heaven's designer. But now this last thing in verse 17 and 18 of Psalm 139 simply says that how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. Wow. God, the creator of all things, is thinking about things to us? He's thinking about you. He's directing his thoughts to you and to me. The creator of the universe not only knows you, he knows everything you do. He pays attention to everything you say and think and do. He not only knows everything about how you were designed and put together and what every thought is, but actually he still loves you enough to even care for you and all of his thoughts are for you? And look at what the psalmist says. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. That means, wow, look how many thoughts you have to me, God. Look how many thoughts you have times when you're thinking about me. You really do care about me. In fact, it says, if I should count them, they would be more in number than the sea, than the sand. More in number than the sand. Now, I don't know about you. I don't think that I would want to try to start counting the sand that's on even one beach. But then you think about all the beaches in all the world and the sand at the bottom of the ocean and everywhere. It's infinite. In other words, God's thoughts about you, God's thoughts, His good thoughts to you, are infinite in number. That's how much He loves you. That's how much He loves me. And then the psalmist David concludes the very last part of this psalm. He says, or in verse 18, rather, where we're going to stop today. He concludes, and he says, when I am awake, I'm still with you. 
In other words, God, just the first part of this psalm is just so amazing. It's like a dream. It's like a dream. You know everything about me. You still care for me. You promise to be there with me all the times. You're going to lead me in front. You're going to protect me from behind. You're going to be there with me even though you know all the things that I'm ever going to do in this life. You still love me and your thoughts that you have for me are always good and they're more in number than I could ever, ever count. This is like a dream, David is saying. And then he says, but when I wake up, you're still there. It's not a dream, it's real. God, you are with me and you love me. Now you understand just how beautiful that verse is in the book of John, in Habrit HaKadoshah, or the New Testament. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe? Do you belong to Him? There's going to come a day when it will be too late. For some people, that day may be today. That hour may be now. That second might be the last second, the last heartbeat, the last breath. We never know. If we knew, there'd be a lot more people prepared for dying than there are today. Don't let that day take you by surprise. Give your life to Him. It says that if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. His name is Yeshua, Amashiach, the Lord, the Father, God the Father, the Creator of all things, sent His only begotten Son to die for your sins and for mine. That if we believe in Him, Yeshua, we would have everlasting life and not perish. Is that everlasting life yours? It can be. Pray with me this prayer. Just say simply, Father, I do believe in the one that you sent. I believe that Yeshua is your son, that he is the Lord, and that he came to die for my sins, and that he was raised again from the dead by your mighty Holy Spirit, and that he sits right now at your right hand. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life and cleanse me and make me whole. Save me. Let me be yours forever. In Jesus' name I pray. B'shem Yeshua, ani mitpalel, abenu sheba shemaim. In the name of Jesus, I pray, our Father in heaven. Amen. came to my rescue and